Good morning, good morning. It's been a been quite the hectic morning to get this all um, set up. I was having some issues, so I'm glad I'm here. A little bit after market open, but um, let's uh, let's check what's going on here. Also, if you wouldn't mind giving me an audio check, just to make sure everything sounds all right. Looks good. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So let's go to. Why am I not? See, there we go. Watch list. Oh, AMC is looking pretty good this morning. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, we got a really good opening here on AMC. Awesome. Good to hear. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, AMC opening really strong. 7% up. GameStop up 13, 14%. I mean, we're still at 46 bucks, but, um, you know, is what it is, I suppose. Tilray not looking so good. Oh, welcome, Tracy. Thanks for becoming a member. Appreciate you. Um, yeah, Tilray. I might have to average down on my Tilray shares. I mean, I'm down like, let me check. I really thought I was buying in at the bottom last week when it was down like 40 some percent. Uh, let's see here. Let's see how much I'm down on my, at least I didn't buy a crazy amount. I just bought like a thousand bucks. Um, Yeah, Tilray, geez, I'm down 30%. And that was after it was already down like 42%. Yeah, I might have to buy some more of that. Yeah, AMC, is there any, let's see if there's like news that, um, let me drink some coffee. Make sure you smash that like button too if you're just joining, that way we can pump this stream out. All right, coffee chugged. Coffee chugged. Let's get everything set up here. Let's see, uh, was there like some AMC news that's popping off or is this just kind of a... Um, let's see here, we got a trade potentially. On CNBC's options action, Mike Kuwau? I'm sorry if I said that wrong, spoke about option strategies investors could use, um, options strategies investors could use for AMC Entertainment's holdings. The company is going to report earnings this week and the options market is expected to move, expected a, expecting a move of around 14% in either direction. The stock normally moves around 8%. I mean, what is normal at this point? Because of the high implied volatility, Kuo, wants to sell credit spreads in the name. He advised bearish investors to sell the April 1st 550 to 650 call spread for a credit of 40 cents. The trade starts to lose money above 590 and it can maximally lose 60 cents. For bullish investors, Kuo recommended the sale of April 1st 550 slash 450 put spreads for 50 cents. The trade breaks even at five bucks and can maximally lose 50 cents. Okay, I was hoping that that was like a an investor who hopped in. Let's see if there's anything else recently. Another AMC open in Spokane, Washington. River Park open. Not seen any like institutional investors that are um, or any you know large buys. Yeah, we'll talk about GE just a little bit later on here. Let's just see what Motley, I take this with a grain of salt, but um, we always had a, or we already had a year's worth of excitement for AMC Entertainment. The movie theater operator limped into 2021 with CEO Adam Aaron, previously having said that the company might be forced to declare bankruptcy if they could not raise enough capital, and then they raised enough capital. Um, biggest threat to AMC over the next year is its debt burden. 
Its corporate borrowings increased from $4.7 billion at the end of 2019 to $5.8 billion at the end of the third quarter, and the company has added to its debt burden since then at interest rates as high as 15%. I imagine they'd be able to factor that down a little bit, but um, I guess from a risk perspective, it might be risky still. AMC's annual interest payments were already steep coming into the pandemic. Its interest expense from its corporate debt was $292 million in 2019. It will be higher than that in 2020 and 2021. What they'll look like post-pandemic? This is another key question. There are signs indicating that AMC could also bent up, benefit from pent-up demand once audience can return to theaters. IMAX said it's a huge surge in audience in attendance in China over the recent Lunar New Year weekend with more than 1 million tickets sold on February 12th. Here's something that I was... Uh, I was talking about a little bit the other day on uh, Trey's Trades uh, stream. Basically, just an, an idea. If I was part of the management team of AMC, what I would have done is try to think big. Okay, how can we get people excited about the movies again? I think there's already a good a good amount of people who are excited about the movies. If I was part of the management team, I would try to have this huge event. Like, like we we set a date. You know, that be I don't know April. 15th or something like that and we'd say like you call the the event like the world is the world is back or, or going back to the movies or you know something like that and then what you do is you sell tickets you know just like one showing or a few showings and then some kind of party celebration afterwards you sell tickets for much more than they normally are like making an event like try to make it like a historic thing like the world is back together celebration you try to time it with a few big movie premieres coming out and you just make it this big event surrounding the movies and so it's like this feel good thing people are going back to the movies jumping right in that way there's this all this hype around the brand i i just think that would be the best way to really like hit the ground running with excitement for movies and you know, spend a couple hundred million bucks, uh, you know, making this rolled out in all, in all their theaters. Um, let's see here. AMC stock in a year. Remarkably, after a brutal year, that's included revenue plunging more than 90% in the second and third quarters. After several close calls with bankruptcy, the stock is down only 22% over last year, and the company paid a 10% dividend yield back then, which is not coming back, at least in the short term. That shows that investors are pricing in a strong recovery for the stock now. However, even if the company benefits from pent-up demand for the theater experience, the company's financial position is going to be significantly worse than it was before the pandemic. Its debt burden will be even greater, and its struggle will to turn a profit with the same interest payments it will have to make. Additionally, the share dilution means that the value of an individual share is much less than it once was. So, I mean, we, we're, all, we're all aware that there are some major complications here. Yeah, there you go. Ads with flashbacks of movie theaters over the year. Like, yeah, make it feel like a, an experience. All right, let's pop back. Oh, that was CCIB. Um, popping back over here. Yeah, AMC, let's check out the um, minute by minute spread. Dang. Now we can assume that there's probably, well, I guess we're only at 8% up. Let's put it in the two minute markers. Just a ton of buying actually going on. Volume, one and a half million. 1.7 million shares, 1.6, 2 million, 2 million, 2.2. Kind of a decent amount of volume, I mean, not anything close to what we've seen um, a month ago, but. GameStop too, ramping up 18%. Is there any specific GameStop news? Like, or is it just people like, okay, it's game time here. Looking for the next GameStop? No. Um, I heard a little bit about this. Wall Street Bets trader Keith Gill appears to have bought 50,000 more shares of GameStop. <laughs> it's kind of a perfect picture for this. Uh, Keith Gill, now famous 
Reddit Wall Street Bets trader appears to have bought more shares of GameStop Corp after the price fell 23%. What happened? Judging by a screenshot Gil shared on Friday afternoon, he bought 50,000 more shares of the stock. Gil previously previously showed he owned 50,000 shares. Oh, so he doubled his position? The Wall Street Journal reported suggesting he had doubled down on his bet. Um, this would put the value of his apparent GameStop holdings at more than $4 million. Um, Gill declined to comment to the journal about the postings. Why it matters. Keith Gill gained popularity in the midst of Wall Reddit's Wall Street craze, and he's been posting about GameStop for a year, also making videos on YouTube under the name Roaring Kitty. Yeah, you can follow him on YouTube, actually. Uh, price action. Well, well, that would sure be interesting if he doubled down. Now is, let me add CCIV to the watch list here. CCIV. Why is it not? Let, I'm going to have to delete a few of these, I think. Making some space. Okay, CCIV, where you at? Here we go. CCIV up 13% for the day as well. Um, I saw that the um, Kathy Woods bought a large position in uh, in CCIV late last week. Uh, bought the dip basically, and that's paying off for them for sure. I think it's up like 30% since then. Let's check out the news there. Let's see here, sweetheart deal in the making. All right, Churchill Capital 4, an electric vehicle SPAC, is reportedly very close to inking a deal with private luxury sedan vehicle uh, maker Lucid Motors. CCIV stock has now spiked to $60 as of February 19th, up over 218% in the past month. The problem now for investors is whether the PIPE, private investment in public equity investors, will get the standard $10 entry point for their investments in the SPAC. This would make no sense for the shareholders of CCIV to allow this since many of them don't get this opportunity. PIPE investor sweetheart deal. For example, let's assume that the PIPE offering is for a guaranteed amount of $300 million at $10 per share. This is, a typical, this is typical of most SPAC deals. This complements the total amount of money, including that from the CCIV SPAC. However, as the merger closes, the pipe investors have an automatic gain of 5.5 times their money. At the close, they purchase shares at $10 per share that are immediately worth 55 bucks. In effect, this turns out to be a, a sweetheart deal for the pipe investors. SPAC investors in Churchill Capital 4, or IV, are likely to bulk at approving this bold-faced transfer of wealth from them to the pipe investors. A more sane approach would be to force the pipe investors to pay a price at a specified discount to the current market price. For example, this could be a 10 or 20% discount. Another approach would be eliminate the pipe portion completely and announce a secondary offering once the deal is closed. This would give SPAC investors a larger stake in the, fi final, in the final Lucid Motors deal. The dilution from the secondary offering would be much lower since the offering would be done at a market price. This is exactly what happened in the recent Tillman Furtada SPAC deal. He's got some really good inter interviews, by the way, Tillman Furtada. He's a really interesting guy. 
um, what to do with CCIV stock. There's simply no doubt that this is the, the single most speculative SPAC stock ever. It has no definitive deal to merge. It does not even have a letter of an intent that is non-binding, at least as far as the market knows. As one author put, the rumor better be true. Whew, yeah, that would be wild. However, on February 16th, Reuters came out with a story that a deal is likely nearing completion after this, as the SPAC sponsor Churchill Capital is now seeking financing, the market value is said to be $12 billion. That's so crazy, no income. However, that's based on a $10 price. Then the real valuation would be 5.5 times that amount today. The deal was said to have $1 billion in pipe deal offering. However, this could increase as much as $1.5 billion. I suspect, however, that if the pipe deal comes out at a pricing of $10 per share, many SPAC investors in CCIV might object. All right. Let's see here. Let's check out uh, GE stock. Let's see. Harsh light on the CEO's failure. Hmm. Haven't really. I mean, they got a full recovery in the last year. With five year, yeah, we're pretty down still from five years. It's very down from their peak in, two th in the 2000s. Wow. Okay. Let's check out some financials here. Obviously, a huge company. One one fact that I that I always think is interesting, you know, you think of General Electric as it's just this massive company, which obviously they are. They're huge. They've been around forever. Um, but a while back, I remember hearing that uh, Berkshire Hathaway has enough cash on hand to buy GE at its current market cap and still have like eighty billion left over. This is so insane. Um, Oh, here's something too that that's interesting to point out. Revenue per employee, four hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's a great revenue per employee. You see that more with established businesses who kind of have these things dialed out. The P to E of twenty makes it uh, kind of outside the range of a value investment. You know, it's um, it's not an insane P to E. You know, if the fundamentals are perfect, I'd be willing to pay a uh, a P to E of um, of twenty if I if I see for whatever in the fundamentals that there's a lot of growth potential, um, but typically just on a value basis, I try to keep it under 15. So that's something to consider. <laughs> Excuse me. I get allergies. Um, price to book 2.66 is pretty high as well. But uh, let's dig in some more here in the financials. So we can see the five-year sales trend is declining. And um, one, one point of concern, you know, is the five-year sales trend is declining. However, the five-year price isn't at an all-time low. So if we go five years back, 2015, I guess we're not that far from an all-time low. 12 bucks, it was at 24, so it's about 50% less price. So I guess relative to uh, 2016, it's kind of a discount, but that's only relative to their past. One thing about GE is, I mean, I don't, they have healthy profits. I don't see them just going anywhere. You know, it's not going to, this isn't going to be a kind of investment that just crashes. But the real question is, is this going to be one that can earn you some kind of reliable returns at a, at a steady clip? It's also not going to be one that likely, you know, bumps up 50% in the short run. But they have net income. It's always a plus, of course. 
Um, five quarter trend actually not looking too bad. You know, I saw a dip in Q2, which isn't a big surprise because most huge companies saw a dip just pandemic wise. Uh, and then we see a little bit of an upswing here. I know they do some stuff in the medical field, so I'm sure that helped quite a bit. Uh, let's see their SGA. SGA is pretty good, fairly flat. Interest expense is declining. That's good. Um, net income. We would have to really dig into their uh, annual reports and, and quarterly earnings statements to see what you know why there might be negative earnings in certain quarters. But year end, it was positive. Yeah, so this is a, hmm. I would have to dig into it a little bit more to see how much more of a value proposition there is. Um, but however, where it sits, I don't see it jumping up much. I, th I see it being fairly flat, at least in the medium term. Now AMC is just up 5%, so of course we're seeing some volatility. We saw a little bit of a pullback on the price. Yeah, we got that resistance right at 6 bucks. You know, we were we were past it at 625 at one point, however. We're back. We are back. 6 bucks. You know, really we want this around like 12 bucks. Tilray now just negative 4.5%. They were negative 7 just a little bit ago. Sundial up 2%. However, that's up 2% after uh, quite the correction. Dang, we had bids as high as 4 bucks almost at one point. And 20 bucks, yikes. You remember the days of AMC being 20 bucks a share? Or I should say the minutes. CTRM up 4%, 5% today. This is one that we're seeing more and more hype on by the day, it seems like. Makes me wonder if this is going to be like one of the next very hyped um, stocks. Let's see how much of a run up they've had already. Oh, wow. So, I mean, in about a month and a half. Went from 18 and a half percent, I mean 18 and a half cents. So we've already seen a 10x run up. I actually kind of take that back. I don't know. Um, we haven't seen huge corrections though, which are, I mean, you know, that's big, but relative to a month prior. Yeah, maybe, I don't know if we can see another 10x run up though on this one, but it's, it seems to be holding strong. Oh man, AMC is um, losing some of its steam here. Now we're just up 2.5%. Bitcoin's actually down 3%, which I mean, we can't expect that thing to go up forever, can we? GameStop up 10%. Welcome everyone who's joining. Make sure you give the stream a like. That way we can push this thing out. Grab your coffees. If there's a specific uh, equity you want me to do a little bit of research in, feel free to uh, say it in the chat.
let's see here. Um, what do we want to? All right, let's look up uh, ACIC. Atlas Crest Investment Corp. Let's look at the news first. Archer Aviation can help United Airlines achieve its goal of total carbon neutrality. Archer Aviation, the company that designs and manufactures commercially viable electric vertical takeoff and landing eVTOL uh, aircraft, has emerged as one of the most promising SPAC plays in recent times. As we've discussed in the previous post, Archer Aviation has now entered into a definitive merger agreement with the SPAC Atlas Crest Investment Corp. ACIC. The combined company is expected to be worth around $3.8 billion when have access to $1.1 billion in gross um, and gross proceeds, including $600 million from pipe investments. In what may be the most striking aspect of this merger deal, Archer Aviation has already secured an order of up to 200 eVTOLs and amounting to around $1 billion from United Airlines. Wow, so they actually have a deal. Um, given the magnitude of this order and the profile of United Airlines, the development has only served to boost confidence in the prospects of Archer Aviation. Nonetheless, this deal also poses other far-reaching ramifications. To wit, this early VTOL order forms a part of the broader uh, commitment by American Airlines to become 100% green by 2050. To do this, the aviation giant is committing to a multi-million dollar investment in revolutionary atmospheric carbon capture technology known as direct air capture rather than indirect measures like carbon offsetting in addition to continuing to invest in the development and the use of sustainable aviation fuel. So we love to see an actual order. That's pretty awesome. Okay. 13 things to know. Let's, let's learn 13 things to know. Atlas Crest Investment first became public in October 2020. Well, they've had a nice little run. Um, at the time, it raised $500 million by offering 50 million units at 10 bucks each. Um, electric vehicle aviation. It believes that this sort of aircraft will fix traffic problems in cities and make transportation more sustainable. The company is targeting affordable, safe, and quiet vehicles to address travel problems. And Morgan Stanley estimates this electric aircraft market will be worth $1.5 trillion by 2040. They feel it's the number one tech stock of 2021. Interesting. Now, I f they probably don't have any sales yet. They probably just have that order, I'm guessing. Yeah, no sales yet. But they have an order and a market cap? No market cap? What's going on there? Market cap 838 million. I guess that's actually not insane if they really have that billion dollar market uh, or billion dollar order for them for their aircraft, less than sales. Market capital left less than sales is um, fairly rare, especially in this kind of a uh, more speculative type investment. Oh, so here we have the uh, buy and sell orders for uh, the day ending Friday. These are always just interesting to me. See Palantir was number one. Tesla's always near the top. Vaxinex, this is kind of a new one that um, Went up 70%. I'll have to dig into that one a little bit. Uh, there's CCIV. Sundial still hanging in there. Number five, still very popular. HCMC, still very popular. Tilray number 17, but yet um, 
I guess the price did go up on uh, on Friday. We're just down today. So let's look into this Vaxinex a little bit. Announces licensing of anti-CCR8 antibody to surface oncology. BCNX. Okay, licensing of antibody to surface oncology. So we're thrilled to continue building on the recent success of our active MAB platform with the announcement of our licensing deal with surface oncology. Um, says Ernest Smith, the chief scientific officer of Vaxinex, the presence of TREG in human tumors is associated with resistance to immunotherapy and blocking CCR8 has been demonstrated to pot potentiate inhibition of tumor growth in animal studies. Um, increases over 60%. Why it happened? A clinical stage biotechnology company pioneered a differentiated approach to treating cancer in neurodegenerative disease, including the inhibition of SEMA4D. It's trading it's over 60% pre-market. Um... Let's see if they actually have any sales. Obviously, a licensing agreement is great, but let's see. Also, let's see this one-month trend. So we went, we jumped up from two dollars and eighty-seven cents to four eighty-eight to five fifteen. Market cap of 109 million, so we're definitely on the smaller side. Um, it's not looking like we have any earnings. Okay, it's still clinical stage biotechnology company. So with this, I'm always just a little worried about um, a biotech company that doesn't actually have sales yet. Just because we know that that process can be so difficult to get through. Um, so to me, a lot of it comes down to the management. Like the management in place, do they have experience getting things, getting new products, uh, getting new medicines through clinical trials? If yes, I have um, much more uh, much more faith in them if they've done it before. I mean, you know, it's on their resume. Of course, it doesn't always have to be that way. You have to have your first sometime, but... Um, We'll see if there's any uh, Tilray news. Tilray. And we're still waiting on confirmation of the merger between Tilray and Afria. An unnamed company tried to buy Afria while it was negotiating the Tilray merger. I mean, it had to be a big player. You probably only have five to choose from. On Friday after the markets closed, Tilray filed a joint preliminary mark proxy statement which provided details of the transaction ahead of the unscheduled special meetings of shareholders of each company to vote on the merger. In addition, as explained in the strategic rationale, the filing provided a detailed timeline of the transaction. As Afria CEO Erwin Simon had indicated in the conference call, the companies held what they had announced in the deal. This transaction was the culmination of 14 months of extensive conversations and negotiations. Well, that makes me feel a little bit better about it. That's been going on for a while. 
Turns out there's been quite the negotiation. In October 2019, the investment banker reached out to Tilray to determine if the company would be willing to meet with, the, with Simon in New York. Ultimately, the director, Michael Auerbach, and Chief Corporate Development Officer Andrew Puncher did so on November 22nd. Um, on February 14th, Tilray proposed an all-stock merger where Tilray shareholders would own 56% of the combined company with Kennedy serving as CEO and Simon as executive chairman and the board of directors split equally. Three days later, Afria encountered with a proposal that Tilray's ownership stake would be 55%. In March, after COVID-19, at least we're really close. I mean, 56% and 55%. You know, it's not much more wiggle room in there, 55 and a half percent. Simon suggested pausing. On March 25th, Kennedy proposed a revision of the ownership to 50-50, the two companies preceded their discussions on these terms and continued discussions into May, at which point they put the discussions on hold for approximately 30 days. So this has been going on for a while. Let's see here. Now we're up to November. Someone informed that Tilray would focus initially and exclusively on closing this closing Sweetwater and would cease discussions until that acquisition closed. In early December, the two companies re-engaged and Simon proposed, proposed a 64-36 split on December 11th. After, over the weekend of the 12th and 13th, the companies agreed to a 62-38 split, resulting in the deal being announced on the 16th. Big question is, who is the other person who made the offer? Here's it was likely Canopy Growth. Yeah, that would make sense since they have the, the biggest market cap out of all the, uh, the pot companies. Well, it's possible the suitor was another company is very unlikely unless it, unless it wasn't a Cana Canadian LP, as there was no other LPs that had the financial ability to co acquire Afria except perhaps Kronos Group, which went up in price only marginally over that time frame. So, I mean, that looks kind of good for the deal being made. If you're feeling really good about uh, Afria, or I mean about um, Tilray, now might be the time to buy some. I might have to buy some more just to average down a little bit. look like um, there's any huge news here with Tilray. Am I buying stock today? Yes, I am. You know what? Let me do a poll. I need to update this poll. Um, let me pull back over here. Well, I update this poll because I still have to buy some from the other day as well. I realized on that day we did this super long stream. I never bought any. So every day here we're, we do a $100 stock buy and you guys vote on it. I just got to set up this poll here real quick. So what are some good um, long-term buy stocks that we should add to the poll uh, today? And I'll add it to the poll options here. All right, I got a few here. Just, just finishing up the poll. OK. 
Okay, so let's put this in the chat. So just vote on this, and we'll uh, we'll do the buy in just a few minutes here. So make sure you vote on it if you wanna wanna be a part of this. So I just sent the link in the chat, so you can vote on what stock we buy here on the channel for our channel brokerage account. So far we got some Tyson, got some Tesla. I need to buy some Apple from the other day. So while we're doing that, let's uh, let's do this other buy from the other day. So this is from, I think Thursday's stream. I still need to buy this, so we're gonna do our $100 of Apple computer. Review order. And looks good. Done. All right. That's our buy from Thursday. You guys voted on Apple on Thursday. And then in just a couple minutes here, so make sure you vote on that poll. Let me just put it in the chat one more time and we'll do another purchase. Yeah, the I have my um this this channel account, channel brokerage account. I ha I just use Robinhood because uh, they allow fractional shares and it was just an easy to use interface. I know it's not people's favorite and I actually only use them for this, but you know. Okay, make your last votes. We're gonna do I'll wait about another minute and then we'll buy some more here. So make your votes. GameStop now at about 10%, AMC now at 3.3%. Yeah, we can check out some more information on AMC in just a minute here. Bum, 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 bum. All right, let's check out this poll. All right, here are the results of today's poll. Looks like we're buying Palantir. Hopefully we can buy that here. Um, cool, yeah, we can. All right, here we got Palantir Technologies. We're buying it. Um, Should have bought it at that dip. Should have bought it last week. But the people have spoken. 3.4 shares of Palantir. Here we go. Boom, bought. There we go. So um, as of starting this, we haven't been doing these uh, $100 purchases very often, but we got Tyson, Tesla, Apple, Palantir. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, so we just got 600 bucks left in cash so far in this account. It'll be interesting to see how, uh, just how this does over the long term, you know, if our, if our group decisions are good or not. It'll be real interesting to see. All right, let's check out some um, more AMC news. 
been seeing a lot about um, available shares to purchase for AMC. Now, I think there might be some confusion there. Because I think the confusion here is people are confusing float with shares that aren't owned by anyone. I think what's happening float is on this page. I don't see it on this page. I think what's happening is the, the float is, um, okay, so you have public float. Let's say a company has 100 shares, just to keep it simple. And the public float is 80 of those shares. Just because the public float is 80 doesn't mean that the other 20 are like up in the air shares that um, aren't owned and the rest, the rest, I mean the rest are owned by public shareholders. All the shares are owned by someone at any given time. Even if you hit sell on your stock, they're still owned by you until it's actually transferred to someone else. Um, so there's not just unowned shares if that makes sense. So I think there's some confusion as, as far as float works. If anyone has like specific questions, I can um, I can try and address them because I think it, I think these qu the questions are kind of based on some confusion. Um, there was another question about AMC. What was it? Let's see. I don't remember what the other question was. Oh yeah, short interest. Let's see if we have any. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's been updated officially, but According to Fintel, it's at 18%. Now I'd be willing to bet we could find it all over the map. High short interest stocks. Let's see. It's not even on this list, which means it's below 20% according to this list as well. So maybe it is 18%. See what market beat says. Short interest, percentage share shorted, 17.46%. Well, there you go. I guess that's, uh, it's, it's around there, I suppose. Not sure when the next um, GameStop hearing is. Let's check here. Yeah, I'm not seeing it on the house schedule yet. Yeah, we'll hear all about it before it happens, but it'll probably be a week or two if I were to guess. Is the AMC squeeze done for? Well, we can't say it's impossible, but um, 
the we can talk to the the probability of it happening and the probability is decreased the lower the percentage of shorts are so the fact that the shorts have gone down by something like gone down by like 70 percent of what they were at its high then it's much harder to squeeze and the fact that this company already has a ton of shares makes it harder to squeeze as as well so one reason why gamestop would be a company that's easier to squeeze is they don't have that many shares um, at least relative to some other companies so fewer available shares makes it easier to um, make the shorts in a pinch because basically the short squeeze happens by you know the, the price increases shorts try to get out there's no available shares no one's willing to sell these shares so just by supply and demand the price has to go up until eventually someone's willing to sell well the more shares there are the harder that is to do <laughs> yeah, shorts have gone down. The shorts are around our ankles right now. Sundial, sundial, sundial. Oh, now we're negative a little bit on sundial. <laughs> this is a PG stream. Uh, we we were down like, or we were up like two percent. AMC up four percent now. Um, let's see on the minute. Just an up down, up down, up down. Hmm. HCMC up just about 12% for the day. Socket Mobile's hanging in there too. This is the company that went up like 900 and some percent in a day, then went down, like down, settled at around 500%. But they're still hanging in there, like much higher than, um, than they were before. We're still 4x what their stock price was a week ago. Let's see if there's any news for uh, CTRM, since I know a lot of people are curious about this one. Now, Weeble doesn't have any commissions. Where can you find the PPP link? I can throw that in the chat here real quick. Yeah, if you have any kind of, uh, if you're a sole proprietor, if you're a contract worker, you do Uber, you do any kind of business, you need to sign up for the PPP. Get some stimulus money. There, I just put the link in the chat. All right, Castor Maritime announces vessel acquisition. This was four days ago, so. Through a separate wholly owned, announces that it entered through a separate wholly owned subsidiary into an agreement to purchase a 2010 Korean built Kamasarmex dry bulk carrier from an unaffiliated third party for a purchase price of $14.8 million. So now they have 12 vessels, which is up 50% from like three weeks ago. It's kind of wild. Um, actually, don't think I've been on their website before. No, I, this doesn't look familiar. Okay, I like how they have this set up. Well, it's been almost a week, so it's about time to buy another <laughs> another boat. <laughs> Looks like every single week, pretty much. So let's look at let's compare this to the 
their stock price. Mm, how do we want to do this? Actually, let's do it here on Rebull. And if anyone wants to open an account here, I, that's what I have pinned in the chat. You'll get a couple free stocks. All right, CTRM. Actually, let's put this on the day. Okay. So I just want to compare the vessel purchases to, uh, to see how much it spikes each time. So let's look February 1st, February 3rd, February 11th. So this is the first, so it went up 15% on the on the first, then down 9%, then on the third it went up only 7%, then down 2%, and the 11th. The 11th up 45%, so that was I think when they purchased three vessels. The next day, down 15%. And let's check out the last one, the 18th. I'm doing this for a reason, so just hang in there. So on the 18th, 4%. Next day is flat. So it seems like just based on the recent past, um, every time they purchase a vessel or announce that they purchase a vessel, Whatever their gains are for the day, they lose at least a third of those gains the next day. So just going back here to the first. 14% in gains, they lost more than half the gains the next day. On the third, 7% in gains, they lost 2.3%, so it's about a third. On the... 11th, 45% gains, lost 15%. So that's a fourth. And then the 18th, and then it was flat the next day. And now we're up again. So anywhere between a, f a fourth of the gains to half seems to be lost the day after. Now that could potentially be a shorting opportunity. You know, let's say they announce another two vessels purchase and their stock price goes up 20%. You can kind of reliably expect it to go down between 5 and 10% the next day. It could be a quick shorting opportunity. Also, you know, as soon as the news comes out, if you're the first to first to hop on that news, um, first to hop on that news the day of, you can obviously ride it up potentially 5 to 40%. Now, the 40% range is only going to be if it's a real big purchase because this is when they purchase, I think, three in a single day, three vessels. You know, one vessel isn't isn't going to be as dramatic. But remember, each vessel is uh, significant because they only have 12. You know, so an additional vessel is like, that's 8% more, 8% more vessel. Now, I do think for the long term that this company still is a bit overvalued, but that isn't to say that there isn't a potential kind of swing trade kind of opportunities here. Can I get that's what I wanted?
There we go. Hmm. I don't know. This could uh, we could see a, night, a little bump in this in the next uh, day or so. It's been about a week since there's been news that came out. We're down from nineteen or a dollar ninety, dollar ninety five at its peak, down to a dollar twenty six. I don't know. There might be a little bit of room to uh, to see a small run up here, especially if some news comes out. If there are any companies you absolutely want me to check out, just uh, go ahead and do a super chat. Bumble, actually lower than what it, uh, what we could actually buy it at when it IPO'd because it IPO'd at around like 75 bucks for you know your average retail investor to buy it. So we're just down a couple bucks there, which kind of makes sense. I, st I still think that this is overvalued. I think, um, the real value is like two billion dollars, which was a share price of like forty bucks. Yeah, Tilray's kind of an anomaly to me. I wonder if there's a site that allow me to do. Like see all these stocks. There we go. So prices now. So Tilray is still, despite all these losses, is still up 68% for the year. Aurora Cannabis down 34%. Wow. Canopy growth up 90%. This one doesn't make total sense to me. I mean, I know they're huge, but um, they don't really wow me. I still need to really dig in and, um, and, and see which one seems to be the biggest winner or, or, has the biggest odds of being the winner once there's legalization in the US. Let's see what this has to say. US companies are overlooked by many investors, but any state and federal legalization favors them over Canadian rivals, fund man managers say. The pot business is rightly described as a fledgling, fledging industry fledging industry. But what investors see as a potential promised land may be further off than many expect because the full federal legalization may take a long time. The unfolding legalization of pot in the United in the United States makes this a complicated and potentially lucrative space for investors. Most marijuana ETFs are passively managed, meaning they track indexes. The following discussion points to an advantage for active investors, active managers of exchange traded funds who can tailor strategies as the legal landscape changes. Meanwhile, investors have better rethink their focus on Canadian cannabis companies, some of which may be cut out of the big piece of the industry action. The devil is in the details. Yeah, it just got legalized in Arizona. There's billboards all over the place. Uh, marijuana has been legalized for rec recreational use in 15 states and Washington, D.C. However, it remains illegal on the federal level. This has led to a bizarre scenario. The Canadian licensed producers, known as LPs, do not sell cannabis products in the U.S. because it's against U.S. law. But shares of the largest five are listed on the NASDAQ exchange or the New York Stock Exchange. Meanwhile, the four largest U.S. companies selling pot products in the states and Washington, D.C. where recreational use aren't listed on U.S. exchanges because they're engaged in these activities that are technically illegal on the federal level. Hmm. They're listed over the counter. OTC. Companies known as multi-state operators, MSOs. Now, I do like Green Thumb. 
I need to dig into them a little bit more. In August 2013, mem uh, mem memorandum to U.S. attorneys now known as the Cole Memo, James Cole, the deputy attorney general at that time, defined the Department of Justice position as relying on states that had legalized marijuana for recreational use to set up regulatory, regulatory schemes to ensure compliance with eight DOJ goals listed on the first and second page of the document. Since then, the federal government hasn't attempted to arrest people within those states for purchasing small amounts of marijuana to use recreationally. Yeah, it's such a, such a weird situation. But under the Investment Company Act of 1940, mutual funds and exchange-traded funds are still not allowed to own shares of the MSOs. Advisor shares has been able to Advisor Shares has been able to work around this problem by purchasing MSO stock total return swaps in the Advisor Shares Pure Cannabis ETF YOLO and the Advisor Shares Pure Cannabis uh, ETF MSOS. The Securities Exchange Commission required Advisor Shares to get an outside legal opinion about the total return swaps, which you can read on the Advisor Shares website. Um, it's easy for a politician to say he or she wants marijuana decriminalized for leisure use in small amounts, but that's not full legalization, which in addition to allowing leisure use of marijuana anywhere in the U.S. would allow banks to provide full services to U.S. marijuana producers and distribu distributors and allow their shares to be listed on public exchanges. Full legalization would also presumably open up the U.S. market to the Canadian LPs. So Aaron's, Aaron's? expects state-by-state -state legalization to continue with MSOs being the biggest beneficiaries. He believes that the Canadian LPs are worth investing in as well, which is why YOLO holds shares of them. Canopy Growth is 38.6% owned by Constellation Brands Incorporated, STZ, the, the brewer of Corona, Corona and Modelo beers, which has many other well-known consumer brands and holds warrants, allowing it to take a majority share in majority stake in Canopy. This gives Canopy deep pockets. The company has an agreement with Acreage Holdings Incorporated, another U.S. MSO, uh, through which Canopy would acquire Acreage Holdings in the event of changes in the U.S. federal law to permit the general cultivation, distribution, and possession of marijuana or to remove the regulation of such activities from the federal laws of the United States. That language comes from page 9 of Canopy's 10K report on its fiscal year ended March 31st, 2020. MSOs have a bigger business already. There's a comparison of the past four quarters sales data of the five LPs and four MSOs. The company's fiscal quarters aren't uniform. So the as of date for the most recent reported quarters data was that was available from the fact sheet on February 18th is the rightmost column. Let's see. The most recent quarter is marked Q0, previous quarter Q1. So for four quarters, the five LPs had combined sales of 1.284 billion, which was up 24% from the previous quarter, four quarter period. So if we divide the combined market capitalization of 33.75, Eight five billion by the fa past four quarter sales. The trailing price to sales ratio for the group is twenty six point three. And now we have the U.S. MSO. So we're just going to compare the the sales to market cap. I suppose again, you'll need to scroll the data. Scroll to see the data. Four quarters. The five MSOs had combined sales of one point seven one five billion, an increase of one hundred and sixty three percent from the previous four quarter period. If we divide the combined market capitalization of $21.86 billion by the past four-year quarter sales, the trailing price ratio for the MSO group is 12.7. So the MSOs are growing their sales much more quickly and have a much lower valuation to sales. Well, there you go, folks. That is huge. Maybe the valuation difference shouldn't be a surprise. The MSOs are only traded over the counter. So individual investors need to go out of their way to invest in them or go with YOLO or MSOS ETFs. Here's another set of data. This time comparing net cash from operating activities 
for the two groups. The first Canadian LPs, Canopy Growth Corp. Let's see. Okay, so we're going to compare net cash from operating activities from the two groups. So even though Tilray reported its fourth quarter results on February 17th, the cash flow information above for the company is only through September 30th because uh, the, seven, the February 17th report didn't include a statement of cash flows. The LPs as a group had negative cash flow from operations for all periods according to fact sets data. Now, if there's a big difference, I wonder if it's simply because in Canada the, the industry has more room to grow as of right now, just due to legalization. But we'll see. The LPs as a, as a group had negative cash flow from operations of all periods. Now the US MSOs, the MSOs as a group had positive cash flow from operations for three or four quarters, for, for three of the four quarters and for the combined four quarters. A counter argument. Wait, let me just look at their cash flow from operations. Um, so green, I, for whatever reason, green thumb always stands out to me. I need to really dig into green thumb and let's see. YOLO and MSOS are actively managed. The only other actively managed cannabis ETF is the Amplify Say More cannabis ETF. You can read more there. Um, during an interview February 17th, Tim Seymour, the portfolio manager of CNBS, said, Advisor Shares has done a nice job building a business where they have the ability to invest in companies I would like to own. He also said that Amplify had taken a more conservative approach when it established CNBS in July 2019 because the SEC had not made a broad ruling on allowing mutual funds or ETFs to invest in MSO total return swaps. In addition to managing CNBS, Seymour is on the investment committee of JW Asset Management, a $2 billion hedge fund. I'm investing in companies that I believe are representative of the best exposure to investors for the best returns right now, Seymour said. He has also emphasized the importance of active management in the space. He agrees with Aaron's when... Um, about the importance of the U.S. market, especially if and when Congress fully legalizes marijuana and enables financial services companies to treat the industry as it would any other legal industry. So I'm also going to look into uh, what bills we have in place right now for the legalization in the U.S. Because um, at this point, I, I feel like I have a good feel just every single day analyzing bills in Congress and the likelihood of things getting passed. I'm going to take a look at those bills as well. Canopy Growth Corp. is the largest holding of CNBS, and Seymour pointed to the acreage holdings agreement as an example of how very well-funded Canadian LPs can be instantly transform, can, transformed into a major U.S. player with full legalization. During an interview February 16th, uh, the CEO of Amplify's ETF said, CNBS was the best performing U.S. ETF during 2021 through February 15th, excluding inverse and leveraged ETFs. He also said the firm was actively exploring the possibility that CNBS would be able to invest in derivative securities. Let's just see what some of these comments say. For those with no street, street connection to buy it, legalization of some was a godsend. But for pot stocks to become attractive, they're going to have to come down with the price of their product. Pot is still cheaper on the street level and tax-free. I don't know how much that matters. Like, if I was going to buy it, I'd rather just buy it legally and pay a little bit extra. But I would never do that. Well, that's really interesting. Um, I've already been interested in, in Green Thumb. So let's pull that up again. Um, 
where's their website? I want to see if I can take a look at their like investor relations. Oh, I sure have. Investors. Oh, this is March 17th is their next earnings call. Let's check out their investor presentation. It looks a lot like the Sundial presentation just from the general feel here. Opportunities in the cannabis industry. 68% bipartisan support for legalization. I wonder if there's a poll for um, I don't think I spelled that right. Yeah, I spelled both those wrong. Does anyone else just cannot spell anymore now that auto autocorrect is a thing? Like I used to be so good at spelling and now that autocorrect, I'm just like trash, trash at spelling. On two thirds of uh, two thirds majority of Americans, including 51% of Republicans, support a bill to federally legalize marijuana. Well, there you go. Two and three voters back the House's historic vote to decriminalize marijuana. Only five of the 163 GOP members who voted on the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act supported it. Uh. I mean, we see this kind of often with, um, it's kind of a strange thing on the Republican side where a lot of times you'll see the voters still want one thing, but the Republican um, legislators might not, which we see with the stimulus bill. Like 70% of Republican voters wanted to happen, but very few Republican legislators want it to happen. All right, bipartisan support. Projected, projected U.S. cannabis market opportunity rivals alcohol and tobacco driven by illicit to legal sales and new consumer adoption. With massive growth expected, expected over the next 10 years across a highly fragmented market. Do we really think it's going to be right on par with alcohol? That would be wild. Yet it's still early in the U.S. with nearly 20 billion legal cannabis sales and a market cap at a discount. Okay, so they're saying it's at a discount. That's one thing that could potentially be, be argued. I guess if we're comparing it to Canada, sure. Yeah, I mean, people are afraid of the OTC markets. Promoter of well-being through the power of cannabis. A place where people come first. The real power is in our people and our shared commitment to giving back to the communities that we serve. Maybe I could like actually interview some of the um, higher ups at some of these cannabis companies. A family of cannabis brands. Okay, 51 open stores, 97 retail licenses, some revenue growth. Revenue growth looks really strong. Okay, 
Okay, establish a license. This is their, uh, this is all in green thumb, by the way. This is just one that I was curious about. I'm gonna have to do an entire video on them, really dig into the weeds here. Drive revenue through the production facility and store openings. Uh, 2020 plus is scale, solidify brand foundations. Let's see if there's um, an earnings call that we can we can find. I feel like that tells us a little bit more information than an investor presentation. Financial. sure if there's old earning calls on here now let's see sometimes earnings calls are kind of hard to find Investor presentation, earning calls, transcript, Q3 2020. Okay, yeah, we don't have a Q4 yet. Perfect, this is what we're looking for. Ugh, I don't have an account. Let me make an account here real quick. Un momento. Give me the darn earnings call, fellas. Okay, here we go. This is their Q3 earnings call. <laughs> He's caffeinated, not high. I'll drink some coffee to that. You know, one day I'm gonna come in here, just busting through the door, hyper as can be. You guys aren't gonna know what hit you. Okay, so do we know? So Jennifer Dooley is the chief strategy officer. Ben Kovler is the founder and CEO. Anthony Jordias is the CFO. So this is street, or chief strategy officer. Third quarter 2020 earnings call. Um, questions? All right, thank you for joining our third quarter earning, earnings call. Following a clean sweep of cannabis legislation measures across five states, the green wave is big and real. In fact, it's like a tidal wave as consumers demand, consumers demand cannabis for well-being. People want a natural alternative to dangerous opioids, chemical pharmaceuticals, and painful hangovers. Okay, we're not here for a commercial. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. The U.S. cannabis industry is rapidly evolving into an estimated 100 billion consumer packaged goods category with projected annual growth rate of 20% for the next decade. It makes cannabis larger than the U.S. wine and spirits industry. Potentially. So the question I'm trying to find the answer to is which one is going is best poised to really take off with the industry. And this might be a very long term play. You know, we could see federal legalization in a few years. We could see it in 10 years, but I feel like ultimately it'll happen. Well, we believe 
we, we believe what is happening in Illinois will happen across the country. It's a matter of when, not if. In a divided country, we are united on this issue, the green wave. Americans voted in support of cannabis. Mississippi opens up for medical use in South Dakota, Montana, Arizona, New Jersey. Join the adult use 21 and over roster. Okay, let's hear more about their company. Let's get to some questions. Okay, here's the, probably the CFO. Yeah. I hope this isn't too boring, but um, this is what real, I guess, research on a company looks like. So it can be a little bit boring sometimes. Our top line growth, uh, so generate a robust 157 million in revenue. Our top line growth of 31% was primarily driven by earlier than expected contribution from our recently completed cultivation expansion in Illinois and Pennsylvania. Gross revenue for our consumer packaged goods business grew by 18 million or 33% quarter over quarter on a net basis, which accounts for intercompany revenue. Our growth approximated 13 million or 41%. On a gross basis, our revenue split for the quarter was approximately 60% retail, 40% CPG, which we consumer packaged goods. Turning to profitability, the company generated gross margin in excess of 55%, which is pretty darn good. I think uh, a lot of other companies we've been seeing are like 45%, 40 Uh, our SGA of 50 million was essentially flat to QT, which is good. I've talked about this many times. You like a flat SGA with increasing sales. Our other expenses for the quarter approximated $2 million, which reflected a favorable valuation adjustment to our strategic investment portfolio, as well as an interest in the warrant expenses associated with our senior debt. Net of these expenses, the company generated $39 million in pre-tax income and over $9 million in net income, providing our shareholders with the first positive EPS of $0.04 cents a share. That's awesome. Has some earnings. You can't say that really about any, uh, any Canadian company. The company also experienced significant improvements with adjusted operating EBITDA, which totaled $53 million, just under 34% of revenue year-to-date. The company has generated $114 million in adjusted operating EBITDA, four times greater than our full-year 2019 figure. Turning to our balance sheet, we ended the quarter with $78 million in cash. This is just $4 million less than last quarter. The company made substantial payments to Uncle Sam and also kept its foot on the gas on the CapEx front, which is probably going to just build more stores. Okay, let's go down to some questions. Um, at the turn of the century, there were a very, very large number of automobile companies producing automobile, automobiles, and of course the industry consolidated. There are a large number of companies in this space. Do you see an opportunity to consolidate the space given the superior job you've done and having a great CFO that you reference on the team? That will be the first question. If I could speak to the second, what is your attitude towards listing on the New York Stock Exchange? So this is something that I've kind of been mentioning about the cannabis industry in general is there's going to be a few really big winners and we really want to figure out who those will be now that isn't to say that an investment in someone who you know has decent sales is just going to go out of business now though they're more likely to get bought up but uh, you really if you're trying to maximize returns you want to be in the company that um, is poised to do the buying you know the microsoft kind of uh player. Um, you're right, turn of the century, whether it's automobiles or prohibition, we use the phrase prohibition uh, 2.0, and I believe history doesn't repeat, it rhymes, so we really look to history for those lessons, and you're totally right. There's a monstrous consolidation opportunities, and now really would probably be the time if it's not <clears throat> extremely overvalued, as they say, at least relative to Canada. You're seeing probably you're seeing probably the industry finish in the U.S., the first wave of consolidation that happened at the capital markets that obviously calmed down. Maybe it'll come back, but there's a massive opportunity given how big the sector is. 
but there's a massive opportunity or, or there's no 50 billion or 80 billion space, which is where we're going to be, where the biggest companies only do 2 billion, 3 billion, 4 billion in sales. You're exactly right where it goes over time. The question is how quickly and when for us with the CFO, with the lens and shareholders capital and really shareholder returns with every dollar we spend, it's when does it make sense? Like always, everything's on the table. Okay. So you tuck in acquisitions are, okay. He doesn't really answer that. It's kind of frustrating. Um, second question on the New York stock exchange, stock exchange, stock exchange. Jeez. I think just backing up a second green thumb is registered with the sec, the U S securities and exchange commission, which puts us in a unique spot that includes we file a uh, gap financials genuine, gen generally uh, accepted accounting princ principles and see the 10 Q in the morning. We file eight K's, 10 Q's, 10 K's gap standard stuff. Um, it's currently not enough clarity in the federal government for listing on the New York stock exchange. We talked about that a little bit earlier. That's why they're all in OTC right now. Cause it's not federally legal. Just wondering if you can unpack and dimensionalize the relative contributions from Illinois in Pennsylvania coming online a little faster than expected relative to Massachusetts and Nevada. Uh, lots of factors. You're exactly right. Production t turned on in Illinois, Pennsylvania drove a lot, Ohio and New Jersey as well. And new markets turn on. And then two things on Massachusetts and Nevada is how to describe it. One is the recovery and two is the growth in that market. So, um, let's see if I can find some more good questions. We're not, uh, just reading. If you have any thoughts around what a potential licensing framework could look like in particular, given the sizable COVID driven budget deficit and state saving. Well, I like this. Um, Retail revenue growth was quite impressive, but it was especially impressive given that most of it was productivity increases, meaning their, their dollar earned, their dollar of revenue earned is more profitable than it was before. Did you have specific assets or states that drove most of that? Um, kind of broken down state by state performance. Um, Should there be any way we should be thinking about that could keep growing up even more? We don't really talk quarter to quarter on how to think about it. I'd say over time, you're exactly right. The retail gross margin does not have a lot of upside to what the retail business is. In fact, it's probably downside or slow mode. The other thing that works against the gross margin is obviously price, nothing but cost horizon, certainly the risk model. If you look at our business and you're modeling it out, just real levers that will drive it, which pieces are driving the biggest piece of production. Not getting a lot of straightforward answers here. Could you talk about New Jersey in terms of your expectations on how soon direct sales will start? All right. I feel like this is uh, 
slow content. I feel like we need to make it a little bit more action packed. I'll pull it back over here for a second, drink some coffee. Do we have any investors of Green Thumb in the chat here? I'd be curious to see. I don't have any shares of it right now, by the way. Yeah, um, High Tide is also one that I'm very interested in. I'm going to do some more digging on that. I guess we could pull up the investor presentation of High Tide. That way we can have this a little bit more balanced. Now we got the earning call. Let's see if I can find the investor presentation. Jeez. Every day I'm sneezing. All right, here's the... Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Here's their investor presentation. This is for High Tide. Six hundred employees, sixty-seven million in revenue, twenty-five million in gross profit. Which what does that come out to as a gross margin? Let me do a little calculation here, real quick, just to do a comparison. Twenty-five divided by comes out to okay, thirty-seven percent gross margin. So we compare that to the fifty-five percent gross margin of. Um, green thumb. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Oh, what's my thoughts about the news segment about Tyson Foods from last night on John Oliver? I actually am not familiar with that yet. I'll have to watch that. So, no, do they have, do they have earnings? Net income? Oh no, they have a loss. Okay, well straight out, straight away, High Tide doesn't have earnings. Green Thumb does. So obviously, to be able to reach profitability is a huge milestone, especially in this industry. Um, but it doesn't mean everything, because it's a very fast-growing industry. Um, so established in all downstream markets, ten plus years of operation, two vertically integrated segments. Retail, they have a bunch of different brands. Um, I don't know. We're going to have to do some trial testing of, the <laughs> of these brands to, to pick our favorite to, uh, to invest in. Uh, okay, here's their differentiation. High-quality retail focus, corporate and franchise. Franchising opportunities, that's really interesting. I... I wonder if Green Thumb is looking into franchising as well, because that can be really profitable. If they get a, a really strong brand, that, that could be the way to open just cross-country really fast if there's a, some kind of nationwide legalization. A creative growth, organic initiatives, business development, and major internal projects, asset acquisitions, corporate transactions. I mean, this is just feel like that's just buzzwords, you know. Miss me with those buzzwords. Short term goals. Continuing continue constructing and opening more retail cannabis stores, convert concepts into fully executed projects, establish a retail presence in all applicable Canadian provinces, hire talented people to help lead, operate, and grow the organization, foster positive relationships with uh, governments and local communities. Long term, build great brands. Okay. I just don't want like buzzwords. We want realistic. So here's all their various brands and milestones. So 
So they got 10 million in Aurora and 4.5 million in Afria. So this is actually a pretty diversified company, which um, of course limits risk. Uh, if they have investments in a few other larger brands, they have you know multiple brands within this brand. Oh, I thought that this was a U.S. brand. Becoming Canada's largest retail cannabis network. 32 locations now open in the provinces of Alberta, Ontario, Saskatchewan. Oh, yeah, this is a good point. When I'm doing my diligence on, on all of these companies, I'm going to check out their like Google reviews. That's a great thing to look at. Good looking store. Number of reward members, 65,000. Wow, okay. That's a nice looking uh, place. World's top accessories e-retailer, Grass City. 20 years experience. What are their sales? Well, that's pretty cool. Strong strategic fit, design and production, brand licensing, optimized logistics, ship from North America to local consumers, multiple warehouses. I almost wonder if they're too fragmented. They're doing so many different things and they're not that big of a company. Yeah, the Snoop Dogg is a, it's, it's definitely smart to do these brand deals for sure. Maybe I should try to get a, uh, <laughs> a brand. That would be so funny. Why invest? Compelling investment opportunity in a retail-focused cannabis leader. The perspective of a manufacturer, distributor, and retailer on the hottest cannabis products and accessories. A loyal built-in audience across Canada in over a decade of retail presence. String, strong host, wholesale and retail infrastructure with a focus on sustainable growth across Canada and internationally a history of growth through operating cash flows and retained earnings with strategic investments by Aurora and Afria. Okay. What do we have? Um, let's see here. Let me just open a new window. Um, market cap. I feel like I look like the 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 guy, the investor to uh, cover pot stock. So I, I might as well just fulfill my look at this point. Market cap of two hundred and sixty million. Sales of thirty one million. So that's a what is that? 260 divided by 31 is 8.3, which is probably much lower than most Canada brands. Now let's see what uh, just for just for funsies. Let's do green thumb. Eight 
8.4 billion market cap. So remember, 8.38. That's a big old market cap. 287. Twenty-nine times sale ratio. So compared to high tide, this one is overvalued. So that's something to consider. Let's see what's going on here. AMC still up two percent, floating a little bit in the green. Uh, let's go to. GameStop up 7%. Tilray down again. Tilray just can't catch a break. It's been a rough go at it for Tilray. Oh, my screen is like that because, well, first off, I have the blue light filter on the screen, but I do that because it's kind of dark in this room and it's just blaring on me. And plus when it's on like just regular whiteness, you have to remember there's light. I have all these screens here and there's light coming off of all these screens. And if I'm just getting blasted with this blue light from four different screens, it just makes me like super bright. So I have to turn it down. So it looks a little bit weird, but So someone asking, uh, I had a question about Trey's podcast. You said no 60 or 70% gains people are looking for, but that is, I'm sorry. You're gonna have to rephrase your question. I'm not really sure what exactly uh, that means. Yep, still practicing piano. I play every single day. All right, we'll do a real cursory overview of uh, UAMY. I know uh, Trey is a big fan of this stock, but I'm not an expert in this stock, so we'll just see what we can find. Uh, actually, let's do some news first. Oh, so my thoughts on uh, on high tide is it's less, it's not as overvalued as many other cannabis companies. And um, it seems strong, differentiated with different brands. It's from my cursory overview, it looks pretty good. But I still, um, you know, you still want to do, you know, more diligence into it. Not really much in way of articles here or anything huge going on. All right, let's just check out there. Production and sale of precious measure, me I can't, can't talk, precious metals. It operates through the following segments, antimony operations, Mexican antimony operations, okay, precious metals. $207 million market cap. A negative 17% gross margin. That is rough. Um, that's harder to dig the, yourself out of that hole. Because a lot of times, you know, your net income might be negative, but your gross margin is healthy. You know, something like this uh, high, t high tide company. You know, they don't have net income, but they had like 37% gross margin. So that's a hard hump to get over. A downward sales trend is always concerning as well. Let's check out quarterly, see if it's any better that way. Come on.
Come on, quarterly. Why is it not? Uh, there we go. Five quarter not looking amazing either. Um, net income, of course, negative. Let's check out their investor presentation. Presentation. This is from 2015. <laughs> um, no, I'm not sure what's going on here. Everything seems so old. Oh, there's Trey. Non binding partnership. All right, AMBRI. Let's see what we can find. Thanks, Trey. Yeah, I need to get my hair trimmed. Um, Rare earth and strategic metals have have an improved outlook due to weaker production in China and increased global demand due in part to battery technology and stock stockpiling. Um, evidence suggests the rally in miners such as Uami is partly fueled by speculative fervor which could cause a near-term reversal. The situation has shifted a bit since 2019, due in part to COVID production and price issues. The company has seen its revenue decline overall. However, the recent surge in UAMI's stock price encouraged the company to sell equity and manage to raise $14.3 million, which is substantial considering the firm had about 10% of that figure in the bank at the end of the last quarter. Thanks for the hair comment. Um, all right. This is important to keep in mind. Well, I see the company as a solid long-term buy and hold. Many of its current buyers may simply be looking for a quick buck and will likely sell once the rally is over. This could create a sharp reversal in the near future. The rally may be going a bit too far too fast, but it does have fundamental legs. First, it recently signed an agreement to supply antimony to AMBRI, an off-grid storage battery firm. AMBRI is a clean energy battery company, so this partly ties UAMI to the rapidly growing market. Second, as with most rare earth and strategic metals, antimony prices are rising. During 2019, the company had an average selling price of 6.7 thousand per metric ton, which declined to around 6K uh, during the first month of 2020, which is difficult for the firm considering antimony prices were generally above 8K over the past decade and were $13,000 in 2012. So that probably has, has to do with their issues with their gross margin. Now they're back at 8.2 thousand. Overall, U.S. antimony antimony's recent surge may be due in part to a combination of speculative fervor and an improvement in, fu in fundamentals. While I believe this stock may be getting ahead of itself, the fact that this is, the fact is that 
its fundamental outlook is improving. Interestingly, the rally in Yuami shares inadvertently boosted its fundamental outlook since it will drastically increase the company's cash reserve. The company will receive about $14.3 million from the sale of about $11 million common shares. Bottom line, overall, I like U.S. Antimony as a company and believe that it has a strong outlook, but I would not buy the stock at its current price, although I believe it's possible we see its income rise to 4 to $5 million and even potentially slightly higher. This would be difficult to justify a market capitalization of $145 million, even at such income levels. Personally, I would only buy the stock at a price of $0.90 cents or below. Okay, so that's an interesting, let's see, uh, let's compare that to some findings here. So they think the income will rise to four to five million. So this person is saying that it's about twice what it should be, that analyst anyways. An income of four to five million is a huge change from what we got going on here. I mean, we'd probably have to see sales triple for that to happen. So he's basically saying if sales were to triple, um, this price would be justified. Now, how much have we seen the price change here? In, let's do three months. Quite a bit. 43 cents to, I mean, it's seen a little decline, $1.83. So fundamentally wise, um, I think it's overvalued. Now, you know, maybe there's some kind of swing trade opportunity. Well, it doesn't seem like it's going to go much lower than we're at right now. Because we just keep on bouncing right around this $1.87-ish mark. So we keep floating around this mark. Hmm. $1.87. Right, $1.85. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some an uptick, at least in the short run. I think in the long run, we are looking at an overvalued company as of right now. If you're looking for the long run, maybe you'd want to wait until some hype is over. But I kind of feel like in the short run, we might see some kind of spike. I mean, despite the fact that we're down 8% today so far. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate that. Um, did I see Trey's last video on AMC after I had him on here? I believe I did. Pretty sure. We. I was also on his channel and we talked a lot about it. Yeah, that could be a potential, uh, you know, sell on the spike and uh, and reinvest it later on if you're looking for a long-term buy. Timing, of course, is always very difficult. Um, I'm uh, I'm trying to get a little bit better at the technicality side. Obviously, that's not you know, it's not ever a guarantee, but um, you know, based on just technical aspects, it looks like it has the potential to have a little run up here. But real long term, a more realistic price is probably about a buck. So I think we're paying a little bit of a premium here, long term. <laughs> oh yeah, Trey's always hyped about AMC, <laughs> which I'm glad because uh, you know I have my position in AMC, so I'm glad that there's uh, there's still hype around it. We're up 4.5% today, which is, I mean, I'm still, 
very negative. I'm probably I'm probably still down 1600 bucks or something like that. But, you know, that's how it goes sometimes. Anyhow. All right, I think that's going to do it for today. Just a quick stream. Make sure you like the stream, subscribe if you like what's going on here. Become a member if you want. I think I'm going to do some kind of giveaway for uh, members. I haven't decided exactly what I'm going to do, but it's going to be significant. But uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in. I'll be back later on this week. Um, I'll, uh, I'll make a post so you can uh, set a reminder for the next stream. Thanks for watching.